Hello, I'm Michelle Crummel, and in this video we're going to be learning how to solve differential equations using a technique called separation of variables. Let's start by defining what we mean by a differential equation. A differential equation in x and y is an equation that involves x, y, and derivatives of y. So we have seen differential equations throughout this course. We haven't necessarily called them by that name, but it's really just an equation that involves a derivative. So the first example we have here, 2xy prime minus 3y equals 0. y prime is the derivative in this equation. It's the derivative of y. In the second example, we have dy dx equals 3e to the negative 4x. So here we also have a derivative in our equation, the dy dx. We're using Leibniz notation. Uh, but these are both examples of differential equations. And you're free to use either one of these notations. If you don't feel like writing out dy dx for your derivative of y with respect to the variable x, you certainly can write y prime in its place. Now let's define what we mean by the solution of a differential equation. So we are used to finding solutions in algebra that are numbers. For example, you solve an equation and you end up with a solution of x equals 7. Right? That's typically the kind of thing that we do when we're solving algebraic equations. Not, and not necessarily always solving for x, but we're used to ending up with a number as our solution. When we solve a differential equation, instead of getting a number as our solution, we're going to get an equation as our solution. So remember that there is a derivative in our differential equation, dy dx, and our solution is going to be the equation y equals and then some function of x that is going to satisfy our equation. In other words, it's going to make the left-hand side of our equation equal to the right-hand side of our equation. So we should expect our solutions to be in the form of equations. So function y equals f of x is a solution to a differential equation if the equation is satisfied when y and its derivatives are substituted in for f of x and its derivatives. And we're used to checking solutions in our algebraic equations like this. For example, if you were solving an algebraic equation and you end up with x equals 7, how do you verify that that is a solution? Well, you would substitute 7 in for x and make sure that your original equation is satisfied, meaning the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. So same thing applies here. It's just that we'll be substituting in uh, more than just a number for our y. For example, let's consider the equation y equals ce to the negative 2x. Now that's not a differential equation, that's a regular equation, it's an exponential equation. But we're told here that it's the general solution to the differential equation y prime plus 2y equals 0. So what that means is if we substitute, so we know y equals ce to the negative 2x here, right? So if we take this and we substitute it in for the y, because that's what y is equal to, according to our solution here, and we substitute in the proper thing for y prime. And by the proper thing, I mean if we know that y equals ce to the negative 2x, then we can find y prime. We know how to find the derivative of ce to the negative 2x using our exponential rule and our chain rule and our constant multiple rule. This is going to be negative 2ce to the negative 2x. So then we could substitute this in for the y prime here and see if the left hand side does in fact equal 0. If so, then that is a solution to this differential equation. So let's practice verifying a solution. In this problem, we're already given the solution. We're told that y equals cx cubed is the general solution to the differential equation xy prime minus 3y equals 0. Then we're asked to find the particular solution determined by the initial condition y equals 2 when x equals 3. So we have a, a difference between a general solution and a particular solution. The general solution is going to have this unknown constant of integration in it. When we express the solution, we have the c in there as a placeholder for a constant. We call that the general solution. If we are able to solve for the value of that constant, then we call it a particular solution. But let's start, first step, just verify that this is in fact a solution to our differential equation, which is right over here. So we have left-hand side, 
xy prime minus 3y. We're going to make some substitutions. So this is equal to x. And then what are we going to substitute in for y prime? Well, we know that y equals cx cubed. And so if we take the derivative of that, we'll be able to find y prime. And the derivative of cx cubed is 3cx squared. So I am going to substitute 3cx squared in for this y prime right here. So we'll have x times 3cx squared minus 3 times y. And I'm going to make another substitution because I know that y equals cx cubed. So I'm going to substitute that in for y, cx cubed. And I'm going to simplify. So that equals 3cx cubed minus 3cx cubed, and that equals 0. Now our right-hand side of our differential equation, looking back over here, the right-hand side equals 0. And so now we have left-hand side, so I'm actually just going to write it right here, equals right-hand side. So we have left-hand side equals right-hand side. Therefore, y equals cx cubed is a solution to the equation, and it's a differential equation, xy prime minus 3y equals 0. Okay, so we have verified that this is, in fact, a solution to our differential equation. Now we're going to find the particular solution. So we're going to solve for c. Right here, we want to know what is the value of c that is going to satisfy our differential equation if, and then we have this information right here, if y equals 2 when x equals negative 3. So let's clear our work here. And we have the solution y equals cx cubed. We also know that y equals 2 when x equals negative 3. So in other words, the point negative 3 comma 2 is on the graph of y equals f of x. And so when x is negative 3, so we can substitute, let's highlight that. We'll substitute the negative 3 in for the x, and then we'll substitute the 2 in for the y, and solve for c. So we have 2 equals c times negative 3 cubed. 2 equals negative 27c. c equals negative 2 over 27. And now that we know the value of c, we can come back up here this is our general solution. And we're going to substitute in our value of c to get the particular solution. So we'll have y equals negative 2 over 27x cubed as our particular solution. For our next example, find the particular solution for the differential equation dy dx equals 6x squared plus 6x plus 2, given that f of 1 equals negative 2. So this extra information here is going to allow us to solve for c, and so we will end up with a particular solution. We'll find a general solution first, and then we will substitute in this information to solve for c and get the particular solution. So we have 6x squared plus 6x plus 2 being equal to dy dx. It's the derivative of something. So how do we figure out what it's the derivative of? Well, we just find the antiderivative for 6x squared plus 6x plus 2. Now we're going to use a technique today called separation of variables. And this is a very basic example, but I think it's a good starting example. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to separate this dy and the dx. Okay, So I'm going to multiply both sides by dx. Oops, dx, like so. And when I do that, I'm just going to have, on the left, dy. And on the right, I'm going to have 6x squared plus 6x plus 2 dx. And now, the variables are separated, meaning that x and uh, the dx is on one side of the equation. And then y, well, there is no y. I guess it's like y to the power 0. And the dy is on the left-hand side of the equation. And now we're going to integrate both sides. So we have what we need for this integral. We have the integral symbol here. We've got the dx at the end. We've got the function in the middle. So we're going to be able to integrate 
both sides here. Now I want you to think about the left-hand side instead of just think of, thinking of it as integral of dy, I want you to think about it as integral of one times dy, where one is the function f of x equals, or uh, we'll say y, y equals one is the function here times the dy, and then we are finding the antiderivative of just the number one. So the antiderivative of one is x with respect to x, but it's y with respect to y. So this is just going to be y, and I'm going to write uh, plus c here for the moment for this first example, because we know when we have an indefinite integral, we need to account for a possible constant of integration there. On the right-hand side, I'm going to just use my reverse power rule here to integrate. So we have uh, 6x cubed over 3 is going to be 2x cubed, plus, and then 6x squared over 2 is going to give me 3x squared, and then plus 2x, and then plus c. However, I don't want to write plus c on both sides like this because now it makes it look like the constant of integration on the left is the same as the constant of integration on the right. They're not necessarily at the same value. So we have to call them different things. You can use different letters, call one of them c, call the next one d. I like to just use subscripts to distinguish them because I'm used to using a c for constant. So we've got a c1 and a c2. But notice what happens here. And this is always going to happen when you are integrating both sides of an equation. You'll have a constant term on the left and a constant term on the right, and we know that constant terms are like terms, and you can always combine like terms. So I can subtract the constant term on the left on both sides here, and we end up with no constant term on the left-hand side of the equation, and we end up with this c2 minus c1, which is just a constant. It's one constant minus another constant, and because they're like terms, again, we combine them into a single constant. And I'm allowed to call my constant you know, whatever I like. I can use whatever placeholder I want for my constant. Well, obviously not. I wouldn't use x or y, but I can use any other letter that I like. So we're going to have y equals 2x cubed plus 3x squared plus 2x. And then I certainly could leave it plus c2 minus c1, but it's a little more efficient if we just give it a single name, it's just a constant term, and I'm going to call it plus c. I like to call my constant term plus c, and I haven't used a c yet because I put subscripts on the other ones, so this takes care of that. And so in the future, when you see me solving these differential equations, you are not going to see me write plus a constant term on the left and then plus a constant term on the right because this is always going to happen. You will always be able to combine those two constant terms into a single constant term. And so generally we just omit the constant of integration on the left hand side of the equation and you'll see where I just write a plus c on the right hand side. So just mentally sort of skipping this step that I did right here in the future. Okay, so this is right here, this is our general solution. If all we needed to find was the general solution, we would be done now. That's our general solution. But we are asked to take this a step further and find the particular solution given that f of 1 equal, or f of negative 1 equals 2. And that means when x is negative 1, y equals 2. So let's go ahead and substitute those values into our equation, y equals 2, x equals negative 1. And that's going to allow us to solve for c. So we have 2 equals negative 2 plus 3 minus 2 plus c. Add the 1 over to the other side, we get 3 equals c. And so now we just need to substitute the value of c back into our general solution, and we will have our particular solution. So we end up with y equals 2x cubed plus 3x squared plus 2x, and then I'm going to substitute 3 in for c, and this is our particular solution. In our next example, we want the particular solution for the differential equation dy dx equals x plus 2 over 2y, given that f of 0 equals 2. So the first thing we're going to do is separate our variables. I'm going to multiply both sides by dx, Okay, so that's going to um, eliminate the dx on the left-hand side. 
and I still don't have my variables separated because there's still a Y on the right hand side. So the next thing I'm going to do is multiply both sides by 2y. And so we can do this kind of all at the same time here, or you can do it in separate steps if you like. But now I have 2y dy equals, and then x plus 2 dx. So I have separated my variables. All the x stuff is on the right hand side and the y stuff is on the left hand side. And once you get it separated, you simply integrate both sides. Okay, so we will use the reverse power rule on the left, and this is going to give us y squared. I'm going to not write the plus c now, I'm just gonna save the plus c for the other side of the equation. So y squared equals, and then I integrate the right-hand side, get x squared over two plus two x, and now I have my plus c here, which is combining the constant of integration from both sides of the equation. So here's our general solution. Gen solution. And again, if all we needed was a general solution, we would be done. Now we haven't um, isolated the y, right? Is This is y squared in terms of some function of x on the other side. It's not necessary, not necessarily necessary to get your equation in the form of y equals. Oftentimes you will be asked to write your answer in a certain form. If, if the question says write your answer in the form of y equals f of x, then yes, you need to isolate the y. We need to get it in the form of just y equals, not y squared equals. But if it doesn't specify that, then this is you know fine to leave your general solution in this form. Sometimes it's not possible to isolate the y. But let's go ahead and find our particular solution knowing that f of zero equals two. So we're going to substitute two in for y. So we'd have two squared equals, and then we're gonna substitute zero in for x. Zero plus c, so that's always convenient when you can substitute in a zero. We get four equals c. We know our c value is 4, so we're going to come back to our general solution and substitute that value in there, and we get y squared equals x squared over 2 plus 2x plus 4. This is our particular solution. Now, if we did want to... Um, write this in the form of y equals f of x, what I would do now is take the square root of both sides. But be careful, I want you to remember that the square root of y squared is not equal to just y. You can't assume that that's equal to y. This is going to equal the absolute value of y, which means sometimes it's equal to y and sometimes it's equal to negative y. And the way we're gonna figure out which one we need is looking at this particular solution. Okay, if I write y equals, if I just assume that it's just positive y there, y equals the square root of x squared over two plus two x plus four, and I substitute in zero for x, I get on the right hand side, the square root of four, which is two. So that works. This is the correct particular solution. However, um, that's not always going to be the case. It's possible that this value uh, given here would be negative, and then we would have to put a negative in front of the square root to make that work, because we should be using the negative y instead of positive y as the square root of y squared. Okay, so this is now our final solution here, written uh, in this form y equals f of x. For our next example, we want the particular solution for dy dx equals x squared plus 2x over y. So I'm going to separate variables. I'm going to multiply both sides by y, giving me y dy on the left. We're going to multiply both sides by dx, giving x squared plus 2x dx on the right, and then we're going to integrate both sides. So on the left, we get y squared over 2. We'll save the plus c for the other side. On the right, we get x cubed over 3 plus x squared plus c. That is our general solution. Now to get the particular solution, 
we're going to use the fact that f of 1 equals negative 3. Okay, so we've got um, the y value of negative 3. Negative 3 squared is 9, so 9 over 2 equals, and then the x value is 1, so 1 third plus 1 plus c. Now we can multiply both sides by 6, just using that because it's the least common denominator for the 2 and the 3. If we multiply by 6 on the left, we get 27. And then 1 third times 6 is 2, plus 1 times 6 is 6, plus 6c. So we get 19 equals 6c, c equals 19 over 6. And then we're going to substitute that back in for c in our general solution to get our particular solution. So let's move this over a little bit. And um, we've got y squared over 2 equals x cubed over 3 plus x squared plus 19 over 6. That is the particular solution. Now it's not in the form y equals f of x. So let's go ahead and continue working with this and try and isolate the y. So we can multiply both sides by 2. Y squared equals 2 thirds x cubed plus 2x squared plus 19 over 3. And then we're going to take the square root of both sides. So again, we don't know if it's supposed to be plus y or minus y when we take the square root of y squared. So we can start by assuming that it's just the positive root and see what happens. If it's not correct, we can adjust it. How do we check to see if it's correct? Well, is this true? If you let x equal 1, do you get negative 3 for an answer? Certainly not, because the square root of a number can't give us a negative answer. Okay, so we can substitute in the 1. We can actually calculate what that is. It would be 2 thirds plus 2 plus uh, 19 thirds. Take the square root of that, and we're just going to get a positive 3. So to make sure we have a negative 3, we want to put a negative there. And where the negative is coming from, it's, ac it's actually here on the y. So we're taking the square root of y squared, and we're getting negative y. But then, of course, you can just multiply both sides by negative 1 to move the negative over to the other side. Okay, so this is our particular solution. So you really need to be careful. Whenever you take the square root of a variable that is raised to an even power, um, pro you're probably just going to be taking the square root of a variable squared. Uh, you need to really think about whether you're, you should be using the positive root or the negative root. Our next example, find the particular solution for the differential equation dy dx equals x to the fourth times y minus 2. So we will start by separating variables. I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by y minus 2. And I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by dx. So dividing by y minus 2 is the same as multiplying by 1 over y minus 2 dy equals x to the fourth, and then we're multiplying both sides by dx. So that's what it will look like once we have separated our variables, and then we can integrate both sides. On the left-hand side, we're going to do a u substitution to integrate 1 over y minus 2. This is a simple u substitution that you might be able to do in your head. It's just going to be the natural log of the absolute value of y minus 2. But if you need to work out the u substitution, you would let u equal y minus 2, and then du equals dy, and so your new integral would be 1 over u du, which equates to ln absolute value of u. We're going to skip the plus c just because we know it'll be incorporated uh, into the other side, and then that will be natural log of absolute value of y minus 2. Okay, so that's the work. Uh, here. And then on the right hand side, we're just using reverse power rule. This is x to the fifth over 5 plus our constant of integration. So this is our general solution. General solution. It is not written in the form y equals f of x, um, but we can get there and we are going to do that. So we have a choice, and I didn't mentioned this choice in the earlier examples, but we had the choice then as well. I can solve for c now in this general solution and then write 
then keep working just algebraically to simplify the equation and get it in the form of y equals a function of x. That's how we did it in the last few examples. We solved for c first. Once we had the value of c substituted in to this general solution, then we worked on getting it in the form of y equals f of x. So that's one option. But the other option is to just go ahead and work with your general solution, get the general solution in the form of y equals a function of x, and then solve for c afterwards. Okay, so you can solve for c before you rewrite your general equation, or you can solve for c afterwards. So for this example, I think I'm going to switch it up, and I'm going to not solve for c yet. I'm going to simplify my general equation until it's in the form of y equals f of x, and then I'm going to solve for c. But you can approach it either way. And the reason I'm, I'm thinking that I want to do it that way, if I solve for c now, whatever number I get, um, and I substitute it in for c, then I'm committed to leaving that number in there. And I can already see that some of the algebra is going to be difficult. We're working with logs. We're going to be exponentiating both sides. So we're going to have e to you know this complicated e exponent with these numbers in it. And so I would rather just wait and solve for c at, at the end. OK, so in order to get the y by itself on the left-hand side, we have a lot of work to do. We have to get rid of the minus 2. We have to get rid of the absolute value. We have to get rid of the natural log. And that's the order in which we're going to, no, actually, that's the reverse order in which we're going to do these things. We're going to get rid of the natural log first, and then we're going to get rid of the absolute value, and then we're going to get rid of the minus 2. So how are we going to get rid of the natural log? Well, we're going to exponentiate both sides. And that means we're going to take e raised to the left-hand side equals, and then e raised to the right-hand side. So e raised to the left-hand side equals e raised to the right-hand side. And you want to be careful here, because a, mis a mistake that I see sometimes is people will write the plus c down here. But it's the entire right-hand side that is being it put up in the exponent. We're exponentiating the entire right-hand side. x to the fifth over 5 plus c. That's all one one uh, thing. So it's e to all of that stuff on both sides here. Now on the left, we know that we can simplify this e to the ln of stuff is just the stuff. So the e and the ln are going to cancel. They are inverses of one another. e to the power ln of stuff is just stuff. So that's going to turn into just the absolute value of y minus 2. Okay, so now we have successfully gotten rid of the log that was here on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we're going to simplify this. And you need to think about when is it that you add exponents, right? It would be if you had like e to the power 2 times e to the power x, that's going to equal e to the power 2 plus x. When you're multiplying numbers with the same base, you add their exponents. I want to undo it. Right now I have um, terms in the exponent that are being added. So to undo that, you undo that through multiplication, not addition. That's another common mistake. A common mistake is to say that this would be e to the x to the fifth over 5 plus e to the c. It does not work that way. It's multiplication. Multiplication. So it's e to the x to the fifth over 5 times e to the c, like that. And c is a constant e is a constant, and so e raised to the power c is a constant. And remember, I can call my constant term anything I like up until the point where I have solved for its actual value. So I'm going to do that. I'm just going to call e to the c. I'm just, you know what, I'm not going to do that yet. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. First thing I'm going to do is get rid of the absolute value. So to drop the absolute value, We'll write y minus 2, and then we need to put plus or minus. It could be a positive or it could be a negative. And now I've got e to the x to the fifth over 5. Multiplication is commutative, so I'm going to write e to the c in front here like that. I'm just going to switch the order in which I am multiplying. And now I'm going to, so plus or minus really means positive 1 times or negative 1 times. So the plus or minus is really plus or minus 
a 1, constant multiple right there. Okay, so we can now multiply both sides of the equation by plus or minus 1. So now we've got y minus 2 equals plus or minus e to the c times e to the x to the fifth over 5. What I'm going to do now is rename my constant term, plus or minus e to the c. And I don't really know for my particular solution yet whether it's supposed to be the positive or the negative, but it doesn't matter because either way, it's still a constant. Whether it's positive e to the c or it's negative e to the c, it's just a constant, and I can call my constant whatever I like. So I'm going to choose to call my constant c. Now, I've already called something else c, because the value of this c is not necessarily the value of this c right here. And so I can't use the same name for both of them. I have to rename one or the other. I don't want to rename my current c. I want to rename the old one. So I'm going to put a subscript on it. And I'm going to go back through my work and put that subscript on all of my c's, because that's the old c. This new c has a different value. OK, so c, e x to the fifth over 5, like so. And now the final step here, we just add 2 to both sides. So 2 plus c e to the power x to the fifth over 5. This is my general solution in the form y equals f of x. Now, to get the particular solution, we need to solve for c. So we are going to come back over here. And we know that f of 0 equals 0, meaning when x equals 0, y equals 0. So we will substitute those values into this equation. 0 divided by 5 is 0. e to the power 0 is 1. So I have 0 equals 2 plus c, which means c equals negative 2. Now I can substitute that into the c in my general equation and get y equals 2 minus 2e to the power x to the fifth over 5. That is the particular solution. Our next example, we want the particular solution for the differential equation dy dx equals y minus 1 over x squared. So we're going to start by separating variables. We'll multiply both sides by the dx, and we'll divide both sides by the y minus 1. So 1 over y minus 1 dy equals, oh, I almost made a mistake there. The, we're dividing by y minus 1, and when we do that, it just leaves a 1 behind in its place. So it's actually 1 over x squared dx. And then we're going to integrate both sides. Okay, So on the left, this is natural log absolute value y minus 1. We'll save the plus c for the other side. On the right, this is negative 1 over x plus c. This is our general solution. And now let's go ahead and rewrite the general solution in the form of y equals f of x. Again, it's not necessary to do that every time. And this question doesn't ask us to do that. But I do know on the AP exam, generally they ask you to do that, which is why I'm just going the extra step to do that so you get some practice with that. So we're going to start by exponentiating both sides. When we exponentiate the left hand side, e to the ln absolute value y minus 1. The e and the ln are going to cancel out. So that's nice. We exponent exponentiate the right-hand side. I recommend using parentheses here so you don't get confused and think the plus c is down on the same level as the e. It is not. It is up in the exponent. Then we're going to drop the absolute value. So I'm just going to have y minus 1 equals. And the plus, when I drop the absolute value, it's going to give me a plus or minus. I'm going to move that over to the other side. And by move it over, I really mean I'm multiplying both sides by plus or minus 1. And so the plus or minus is going to then appear on the other side. And I'm going to separate. My exponents are being added. So I'm going to separate that as e to the negative 1 over x times e to the c. And multiplication is communicated, is commutative. So multiplying by e to the c. I can do first e to the c times, like that. And then this term right here is all just a constant multiple. It's a constant multiple, so I'm going to call it c. And when I do that, I'm going to go back and I'm going to rename my old c's something different. You can change the letter. And if you don't like 
going back with the subscripts, you can change the letter here and just call it like D or F or whatever you want. So that's now just a C, E to the negative one over X. Then we're gonna add one to both sides. So we get Y equals one plus C E to the negative one over X. So this is our general solution written in the form Y equals F of X. To find our particular solution, we want to sub in this condition f of two equals zero. So this tells us when x equals two, y equals zero. Let's make that substitution. So we get zero equals one plus c e to the negative one over two. And that's not gonna work out very nicely. Let's see, we've got um, c equals negative one, over e to the negative one half, and we can move e to the negative one half up into the numerator, c equals negative e to the one half, and e to the one half is the same as the square root of e. I think it'll just be easier to write it that way. So our particular solution will be y equals one plus, now instead of a c, I'm gonna write negative root e, so let me take away that plus, minus root e times e to the negative one over x. So I think it's perfectly fine to leave it written that way, but uh, if this were a multiple choice question, I can see where that would probably be simplified a little differently. We, it would probably be, this is e to the one half times e to the negative one over x, and then you, because the both numbers here, e to the one half, e to the negative one over x have the same base, you can add the exponents, minus e to the one half minus one over x, like that. It's probably how it would be uh, written in simplified form. Okay, so this is our particular solution. For our last example, we have a word problem and the differential equation is not stated explicitly. We're gonna have to write that ourselves. So we're gonna wanna translate some of this information here into a differential equation. So it starts out by saying the rate of change. So right away I know it's referring to a derivative. The rate of change of the number of coyotes n of t, so they're even telling us what to call our variables. The rate of change of the number of coyotes, n of t. If we switch to Leibniz notation, then the since the independent variable is t and the dependent variable is n, the rate of change of the number of coyotes is gonna be dn over dt. So dn over dt is directly proportional to is directly proportional to means is multiplied by a constant. And oftentimes the constant of proportionality is a K. It doesn't have, there's no special reason for using the letter K, but that's often what you'll see. Okay, so we've got, um, wait, let me erase the is part because that's the equal sign. Is is going to be our equal sign. Directly proportional to tells us we're going to be multiplying something by a, con a constant multiple. Okay. What are we what are we going to multiply k by? Well, whatever it's proportional to. So what does it tell us? It says it is directly proportional to 650 minus n of t. So that's what we're going to be multiplying the k by. 650 minus n of t where t is measured in years. n is number of coyotes. Okay, so those are the units that we're working with. So right here is our differential equation. When t equals zero, the population is 300. And when t equals two, the population has increased to 500. Find the population when t equals three. There's a lot of parts to the problem, but let's just start with our differential equation, dn dt equals k times 650 minus n of t. Now n of t is function notation. I'm just gonna refer to it as n to make um, the manipulation of the equations a little easier. We can come out of function notation. That's just like, instead of calling a function f of x, we sometimes just refer to it as f, right? So if our function is n of t, it's fine to just refer to it as n. It's gonna make, um, the equation easier to work with if we do that. So we know that when t equals zero, the population is 300. And that means that n of zero equals 300. 
And we also know when n equals 2, so n of 2, the population is 500. Okay, so we're going to need to use that information later on in the problem. But for now, what we want to do is solve this differential equation. So we have an equation for n of t. And we're going to separate variables. So keep in mind that the variables are t and n, not k. k is not a variable. It's a constant. We just don't know what its value is yet, so we have to call it k. But the variables are the n and the t. So when we say separate variables, we want all the t stuff on one side and the n stuff on one side. So we want the dn to stay on the left since it's in the numerator, which means I want to divide both sides by 650 minus n. So I'll end up with 1 over 650 minus n dn. And then I'm going to multiply both sides by dt. So on the right, I just have the k and then dt, like so. I have now separated my variables, all the n stuff on the left, all of the t stuff on the right, so we can integrate both sides. On the left, we're going to use a u substitution to integrate this, and we're going to get the natural log of the absolute value of 650 minus n times negative 1. And that extra negative in front is going to, you'll see if you work out the u substitution the long way, uh, that's, that's because the derivative of 650 minus n is equal to negative 1. And then on the right, we have k, remember, is a constant multiple. So the derivative is k times t, plus our constant of integration, so plus c. So we have a lot of letters here, but the k and the c are both constants. The t and the n um, are our variables. Now I'm going to multiply both sides by negative 1 because I don't want to exponentiate now. If I exponentiate now like that, the e and the ln will not cancel out. That negative in between them will prevent me from canceling the e and the ln. So don't want that negative there. I'm going to multiply both sides by negative 1. So I have the ln absolute value 650 minus n equals negative kt. Now, technically, we're multiplying by negative 1, so we should have minus c, right? But minus c is still just a constant, so if we wanted to, we could just call it plus c. If I wanted to call it plus c here, then I would have to change the old c. I'm not going to bother uh, doing that because minus c isn't that much more difficult to work with than plus c, so I think I'm going to just leave it like that for now. Then we're going to exponentiate both sides. So we'll do e to the left-hand side equals e to the right-hand side, and let me just move that equal sign down lower because it looks a little odd like that. Okay, so I'm exponentiating both sides. The e and the ln here are going to cancel out. Now we'll have absolute value 650 minus n, and to drop the absolute value, we're going to multiply the other side, the whole entire other side, by plus or minus 1. So plus or minus, and then we're going to split up e to the negative kt minus c into e to the negative kt times e to the negative c, like that. And now this plus or minus e to the negative c, all of that is a constant multiple. It is a constant multiple. If we knew the value of c, then we could compute the value of that constant. Okay, so I'm going to rename that constant multiple you can just call it D if you, if you want. I'm just going to call it C. And because I'm calling it C, I'm going to rename the old constant, like so. So now I have 650 minus n equals CE to the negative KT. Let's um, isolate the n. So we have n equals 650 minus CE to the negative KT. That is our general solution, and we've isolated the N, so it's in a nice form. But we can't answer the question, find the population when T equals 3, yet, because although we can substitute 3 in for T, we will not get a value for N because we don't know the value of K. So we need to try and solve for k. Oh, we also don't know the value of c. So we have to try and solve for k and we have to try and solve for c before we can find um, constant values for n. And so we are going to use these two points to help us do that. Let's start with 
this one right here. We know that when t equals 0, n equals 300. Let's make that substitution. So n equals 300. I'll switch colors. n equals 300 when t equals 0. So negative k times 0 is just going to be 0. Okay, and e to the 0 is just going to be 1. And that means that c equals 650 minus 300, so 350. Now we know the value of C, we can substitute that into our general solution. So general solution, we will update that now as 650 minus 350 e to the negative kt. We still have to solve for k in order for this equation to be useful. So we're going to use the other point here to do that. We know when um, t equals 2, n equals 500. So 500 equals 650 minus 350 e to the negative k times 2. Okay, so 500 minus 650 is negative 150 divided by 350 uh, we're going to have to go to the calculator because uh, there's no way k is going to end up uh, being equal to an integer. So let me grab my calculator. And so we're going to do 500 minus 650 and then divide by negative 350. That gives 0 0.429 equals e to the negative 2k. We're going to take the log of both sides. So we'll do ln of the left-hand side and then move that over equals ln of the right hand side and then the ln and the e are going to cancel out so the natural log of 0.429 is negative 0.846 equals negative 2k divide both sides by negative 2 and we get k is 0.423 so now we're going to substitute that into our general solution, or our, I guess, particular solution uh, for the k, and update this equation. Now it's n equals 650 minus 350 e to the negative 0 0.423 t. So here is our particular solution, and we're ready to answer um, this question, find the population when t equals 3 by simply substituting 3 in for the t right here. And that's going to give us n of 3 equals. And again, we'll need the calculator to calculate that. And I get 551.654, or approximately 552. That is the population at time three, so that is number of coyotes. And that wraps up our lesson on solving differential equations. There are certainly many more techniques for solving differential equations. We focused on the separation of variables technique today, and in our next lesson we are going to look at how we can approximate solutions to differential equations graphically using something called a slope field. Thanks for tuning in today. I will see you next time.